Welcome back to VMworld Live. I'm John Troyer. We're here in Copenhagen at VMworld 2010. Very pleased to have with me for my next segment, Adrian Collier, who is the CTO of our vFabric business unit here at VMware. Adrian, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be with you, John. So vFabric is a new brand and kind of new overall umbrella term that we introduced, I guess, at, in San Francisco at yes, VMworld this right. year. Uh, that covers, uh, well, I'll let you explain. It covers Spring, a lot of our development tools and a lot of the acquisitions and platform as a service kind of environments that you guys have been accumulating and building. So, I mean, is that a good ex is that a is that a good way of describing? Yeah, that, that's a great way into it. Yeah, I mean, really, what it's all about is if you look at what's happening inside the enterprise, and as you start to do all this cool stuff at the infrastructure layer, and with infrastructure as a service, creating a very automated, responsive kind of IT infrastructure environment. Um, one of the key challenges actually is, well, can the applications that I'm going to write? actually exploit all the capabilities of that environment. You know, it'd be like laying down a really nice high-speed rail track, but if you put the old rolling stock on it, you're not going to be able to get the end benefit. And so, when we really started to look at that, it was like, okay, how do we actually do we enable the enterprise developer to first create an application that's going to work well in this world? And then secondly, what are the set of runtime services that that application can depend on that really can cope in you know, what we call a platform as a service world, which really means things like, um, you have to be able to dynamically configure it. We don't, up in advance, have an administrator who comes in and you know, carefully sets up this environment and then it stays steady. You know, now this whole middleware layer is gonna come and go, it's gonna scale horizontally. Can the application cope with that? Can the middleware cope with that? Um, if we project forward, we look at some of the hybrid cloud scenarios that you know, VMware is now enabling. Well. What does that mean for the application? How is the actual you know, the data going to be handled across that link? How is the messaging integration going to work? And so there are a set of challenges involved in building and running applications that actually can exploit all this exciting new technology down at the infrastructure layer. And in essence, vFabric is all about um, dealing with those challenges. A, giving the programmers a programming model that helps them write modern applications that address some of these concerns, and then very much, what are the set of platform services they're going to thrive and work well in this kind of dynamic platform as a service world. Okay, that's kind of interesting from a, from a VMware strategy point of view. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, with virtualization, I like the way Paul describes it. He talks about, well, there are applications that are already here and they're built Absolutely. and they're not yep. going away. You can't pretend that they're just going to go away. We're we're still dealing with DOS apps in some cases. Yep. Those you can virtualize, <coughs> put it put in as a workload, put in your dynamic data center, use up your resource pools, and that's really more, more where some of our IT admins are, are more familiar deal yep. working with. But um, we do definitely it's it's you know times have changed and applications need to change too. Is it a case of applications becoming more virtualization aware, or the infrastructure becoming more application aware, or or, or both? Uh, to a degree, both. Um, but also to an extent neither. You know, one, okay. one of the things we hope is that for the application developer themselves, writing an application, in this case using the Spring Framework, should look very, very similar, if not the same, for the new world as it did in the old world. You know, one of the things that would not be good is if suddenly, to go to a platform as a service environment, you had to start recoding and retraining with developers and working in a completely different way. That would actually be a bit too disruptive. And so one of our first goals actually is take your Spring-powered applications, they're often deployed physically today. They would work great virtually, and they would work in various platforms and service environments, including our own, but also third parties such as the Google arrangement that we have. Um, and so for the developer, although there's a new kind of service they might want to deal with, really they're not particularly aware that this application is going to run virtualized. If you take a step down and look at the kind of the runtime or platform services, again, there will be some awareness now, things like, you know, um, when I provision, for example, key one. I have logical tiers inside the application, the way this is structured. Obviously, as we virtualize that, we need to make sure that the vShield zones and the edge stuff gets put in place appropriately. So or when I have a, when multiple tiers, I have a database server and an app, app server and yes. some sort of uh, yeah, only There server. are rules about who can talk to who and what traffic can flow. And right. Obviously, in a physical world, you would secure that in one way. In the virtual world, with things moving around, you need a smarter solution for that. Um, likewise, another classic would be from that understanding of the pattern, putting in place anti-affinity rules. You know, in the physical world, you might say, I'm going to run on, let's be small, three application servers on three physical boxes. 
And you want to do that to not have a single point of failure, etc. Well, if I virtualize and I've got three virtual machines, <laughs> what happens if I get them all provisioned on the same box? And you know, maybe I don't do that initially, but then you know, someone comes along and v-motions them all onto the same right. box. So you need to set up those kind of anti-affinity rules and understandings. Um, a lot of that is actually about teaching the virtualization layer some understanding of what's going on and what's actually running in those virtual machines to one of those patterns. And, and the goal is some of that just happens, uh, I don't want to, if not automatically, at least in a more kind of rules-based, policy-based way. Absolutely. The, the idea is, you know, when, when you get to the end goal, you upload your application artifacts, which would be you know, the war file and other related things, and, you know, a policy document that describes things like the intended SLAs, but, you know, how it should be scaled, what the parameters are for your know, minimum and maximum bounds, maybe, um, and things like you know these are the logical tiers, these are the affinity groupings, and that you know as we provision that down, you know yes you could go in and administer the, the vCenter layer to do that by hand, but you shouldn't need to. We should just understand that application layer and make it happen out of the box. Now right now, um, Spring obviously is a Java platform. Absolutely, uh, at least uses the JVM. And, yes, it does. Uh, you yep. know we can use Groovy and things like that. But I understand, um, I was talking to Steve Harrod yesterday, and uh, he was mentioning, or two days ago, he was mentioning other languages as well. Is that something we're, we're working on or interested in? Absolutely. I mean, if you, look, if you look at it, kind of zoom right out, then what are we interested in? We're interested in developer communities, writing applications that are then going to run on a set of platform services that ultimately run on a virtualized infrastructure. Um, at every level, there are choices. We're not going to constrain developers only to our stack. That would actually you know, be very limiting for them. They probably wouldn't go there. But you know, we want to make it such that there are natural, easy advantages that this particular community say, yeah, you know, these set of runtime services are a great place to deploy our applications. And yeah, this is a great place to then you know, infrastructure to run those on. And so, yes, we have great strength right now in the enterprise Java community, estimated two and a half, three million you know, Spring developers. So that gives us very good reach, but there are other developer communities as well. You know, I'm sure Steve mentioned some. You have the PHP community, for example, you know, is large and strong. You have Ruby, you have Scalar, you have you know, Clojure, you have Python, all, all sorts of pockets of interesting things going on. And so yeah, we have an interest in general in you know, how could we help those developer communities create applications that are going to work really well on you know, a, a vSphere-based stack at the end of the day. That's great. That's great. Um, my, uh yeah, I, I, in, in previous days, I, I've, I've been a Java programmer and other kinds of programmers, and, and uh, uh, I, I, I'm anxious. I, I keep meaning to learn Ruby, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you know we get our stack and our platform yep. going. So I, I want to do a little Ruby programming. So from an IT infrastructure perspective, uh, you know things like provisioning, things like scaling, yep. uh, things like manageability uh, are obviously of high concern. And it sounds like either now with the Spring platform and also going forward, uh, it's not going to be science fiction to say that the that there will be some policy-based rules or, or or the platform will know much better about, for instance, how to how to scale uh, when you need more applications, how to provision more application service when you need it, or even there's already uh, with the Spring apps, there's, there's ways of looking inside the app and, and making the app become more manageable. Absolutely, yeah. yeah so that, that was very far from science fiction. If you know, <laughs> solutions that work like that are running today. Um, so yeah, that's entirely possible. Um, you know, one of the key things we have there is a technology called Hyperic, uh, which really is a management tool that can understand both the components of the application, the Spring-based application, a sense that the developer would understand, and then it'll understand, for example, the application server that's running on, the JVM that's running on, and from the most recent release, very importantly, also what's going on at the virtualization layer. So all the vCenter kind of measurements and metrics are there and they're correlated. One of the reasons that turns out to be really important is that um, there's a certain amount of fear and uncertainty in some organizations to say, oh, you know, I'm nervous of taking my mission critical line of business application and even first step virtualizing it. You know, if something goes wrong, you know, the dev team point at the ops team and say, oh, it's your fault, you virtualized it. And you know, the virtual say, no, no, it's the application's fault. And well, what's really going on? You, know, you want to have a, a good conversation there. And so Hyperic will show you lined up all the way from the application component through down to that virtualization layer. What was happening at this point in time? You know, and what is the cause, for example, of the performance issue that you're seeing? And that, that's proven to be a very important tool in the overall story. But based on that you know, top to bottom understanding you then have, um, you can start to determine trends and see, for example, when something's going outside of its SLA. And you can take an automated action in response to provision more capacity, et cetera. Where that gets really exciting now is if you look at, say, the acquisition of Integrion that's able to 
start looking at that data and predict, not just that you have just exceeded a threshold, but you're going to exceed a threshold at some point in the future. Let's get ready for that so that you never you actually have a problem. Uh, so there's some very uh, interesting things that can be done as you sort of tie this knowledge top to bottom together. Is part of the success in, a, in the new world that we're going to, this, this cloud-based, uh, consumption-based, much more dynamic, uh, resource-based world, um, it seems like development needs to work cl more closely with ops, and ops needs to work more closely with development. In, in customers are successful. Is is that one of the? Is that a? Is that a? Is that a common characteristic? Is that so, a necessary yeah, requirement? Certainly, you know, in the in a kind of the most advanced customers that I talk to that are working in this space, you know, I tend to spot them very early on. They're the ones who, to a meeting, bring both the development guys and the operations guys, and we have the whole group round a table. They're very successful. Um, you know, it certainly is true as you look at platform as a service, et cetera, the roles perhaps of what development do, what operations do, subtly change. Um, in particular, you know, it could get the scary moment where somebody from development could actually deploy an application right into an environment, <laughs> um, which is you know, terrifying, yeah. a terrifying thought. And obviously, yeah, people put various processes still around that. But generally, the, you know, the, the split of responsibilities that we really see working out in most of these accounts is that the IT operations, the sort of architecture teams would decide, you know, how do we want this you know, middleware environment to look? What are the services? What are we like to call them the approved blueprints that applications can be deployed to? And it's the job of that team to you know, maybe freed up from doing some of the boring work to actually think about how do I really optimize and get these blueprints working really smoothly? And then the developer would come in and say, here's a catalog of such blueprints I could run my application on. You know, I want to now deploy it to one of those, please. And so that was how those two roles might start to evolve over time. But. Great. Well, Adrian, I've really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for coming by. Great. No problems. Thank uh, you, Joe.